Okay, hello. Um, so, uh, first of all, I have an uh, announcement. We have a new TA, Carl, who just turned his video on. Um, and Carl is going to have office hours Thursday, 2.30 to 3 p.m. via Zoom, and he will send out a Zoom link after class today. And uh, he also hopefully will start grading your first midterm soon. We have to meet and talk about the prompts and stuff. And um, Carl has been following the class, so he's a little bit behind, but he's also studied comp before somewhat. So uh, hopefully he can, you know, uh, help you with our questions and um, be able to get up to speed on grading quickly. Okay. Um, and as far as uh, the modality of the course going forward, I have to say, I have no idea. <laughs> they, they just uh, announced that um, I think the all the staff are supposed are going to be remote working remotely at least through Wednesday. But I guess I'm going to base my decision on what is going on on campus. So um, seems like today it was accessible except for briefly in the morning, but I don't know all the details. So anyway, um, stay tuned for whatever surprises this quarter may still have in store for us. Um, okay, so now the paralogisms. Um, so, um, I mean, there's something weird in the transcendental dialectic that kind of corresponds to something weird in the transcendental analytic, namely that, um, all three parts of the, the dialectical inferences are supposed to basically involve the same mistake. Um, and certainly all the, like when you go into each of the, and at least in the paralogisms and the antinomy, it's clear that there's four parts to each one and it goes according to the categories. And that again, it's supposed to be the same simple mistake. And yet like there's all these like really long specific arguments. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know how to explain all of that either in the analytic or the dialectic, um, but I hope at least I can bring out like both where the common mistake is supposed to be and to the extent I understand it, how these specific arguments are supposed to work. Um, and so again, like the general mistake is supposed to be that, uh, at least as I understand it, this, this, uh, nothing about this is clear, <laughs> but as I understand it, so, um, the logical function of reason in syllogisms is that, you know, in the major premise, we have a rule on a condition. And in the minor premise, we subsume a case under the condition. And in the major premise, I'm mean, sorry, in the conclusion, therefore, we conclude that the case falls under the rule or the rule applies to the case. And, um, but now we, we have an explanation for why it does, namely that the case meets this condition. All right, so that's the logical, uh, employment of reason in syllogisms. And I think what I was trying to explain before is that the attempted parallel to the transcendental deduction is that we're going to say, okay, 
what is it about um, every case in general that guarantees that we'll be able to find this kind of explanation? Um, and I mean, and I, I tried to say before that, like, the real answer is that there isn't anything about the object of this concept that um, that guarantees that we'll be able to find this type of explanation. What there is is something about judgments in general that guarantees that uh, the demand for this kind of explanation will be legitimate. So, um, and so that the regulative employment of reason, the regulative transcendental employment of reason is to tell the understanding whenever you have a judgment, you have to look for explanations for it. Um, but again, the, the um, uh, attempted like bad <laughs> uh, conclusion is that something about the every case in general um, uh, guarantees that we'll be able to find explanations of some kind. So in the paralogisms, we're talking about the categorical syllogism, right? So now I can write it like, um, like this, right? That's what a categorical syllogism looks like. The major premise is a categorical judgment. The condition, at least this is how I understand it. As I pointed out, some of the ways ta talks about this, like in the introductory parts, sound a little bit different than this. But the way I understand it, the condition is C and the rule is B, and we subsume A under C. And therefore, we conclude, but also we have an explanation of why A is B, namely because it's C. All right. Um, and in looking for this kind of guarantee, um, we're looking for uh, a totality of, um, well, is that the right way to look at it? Um, yeah, we're looking for the absolute inner condition that's found in every case that guarantees that there'll be this kind of internal explanation. So the reason I'm calling it an internal explanation is that it's something about the object of A, namely that it falls under the condition that explains why the object of A conforms to this rule. So um, we're looking for something that is like the absolute innermost condition that's going to explain all the things that can possibly be predicated of any object of our experience in general. And um, uh, it's so it's not going to explain like the um, it's going to explain what could be predicated of A in general. It's not going to explain the complete uh, order of A's states. Right? I mean, it can't explain the complete order of A's states because the object of A is always the object of A as the states change. So whatever the internal explanation is going to be, it can't explain that change. Right? But it can explain why all the things that uh, all the changes that A goes through are possible states of A. Um, uh, 
Okay, so so far so good, I hope. I mean, um, are there questions about this? This is what we expect to find in the paralogisms. So, but I guess uh, the qu one question that confronts us right away is, what does this have to do with psychology? Okay. And a particular kind of psychology, Kant calls it rational psychology. I mean, Kant didn't make up that term. This, by the way, rational psychology, um, rational cosmology and transcendental, I'm not sure if the word transcendental is there. Actually, I guess it's rational psychology, cosmology, and theology are three parts of Wolf's metaphysics. There's also a part on ontology. Anyway, um, so uh, what is, so, uh, okay, ra so rational psychology, rational psychology is non-empirical psychology. The opposite of rational psychology is empirical psychology. So things that we can know about the soul a priori. Um, why is why does this search for an absolute internal condition lead us to um, to infer a uh, a self that is not an object of experience? Right, that's that's like the form of, um, and by the way, this is confusing because okay, so this syllogism um, goes from uh, from the condition to the condition. And this syllogism is a member of a series because then we can ask, well, how do we know that A is C? And then we write another syllogism up here and another one, and it keeps going. We keep looking for further conditions. But there's also another syllogism or inference involved here. Um, and that's actually what Kant is talking about when he talks about the dialectical inferences of reason. And the inference that he's talking about actually goes the other way, right? It goes from the condition to the unconditioned. Um, and it only has one step. So it's not one of the ones in this series, both because it only has one step, there's no series, and because it goes in the wrong direction, right? So that, like, uh, the in the A edition of the paralogisms, there's four examples of these syllogistic dialectical inferences. In the B edition, there's only one left, um, but. Uh, I have to skip the whole pay, pay for algorithms to get to it. Here it is. Right. That which cannot be thought otherwise than a subject does not exist otherwise than a subject and is therefore substance. A thinking being considered merely as such cannot be thought otherwise than as subject. Therefore, it exists only as subject, that is, as substance. I mean, it's not even so clear here that we're starting with the conditioned. Um, but that's how Kant is going to explain this premise that in this premise, we're thinking of the empirical subject. So, um, right. 
right? That's the beginning of this footnote here. Thought is taken in two, uh, let me see. Thought is taken in the two premises in a totally different senses and the major premise as relating to an object in general and therefore to an object as it may be given in intuition. Right, so we're starting with, with a self that can be given an experience and we're concluding to a self that could never be given an experience. It, again, in one step. Um, so the only thing that's interesting or weird or confusing about this is that the dialectical inference is also a categorical syllogism. And um, well, I'll talk about this later because I didn't. I wrote this down at the end of my notes. But in the antinomy, there's an example of a syllogism, and it's a hypothetical syllogism. So in other words, even though the dialectical inferences are not the members of this series, they're the same type of syllogism. <laughs> and I don't know how to explain that. So in the paralogisms, the dialectical inferences are categorical syllogisms. And in the, in the antinomies, the categorical inferences, at least based on the one example, or it's kind of a summary of all of them that Kant gives are hypothetical. And presumably, the, uh, there's no example of a syllogism in the ideal. There, the, the dialectical inference would be um, a disjunctive syllogism. All right, but um, in any case, uh, right, so the, that was all a digression because I was saying the conclusion here is that um, the conclusion of the dialectical inference, not the conclusion of this inference, but the conclusion of the dialectical inference is there exists, or not just there exists, but um, or not exactly there exists, but um, we we represent, we we know uh, an object that could never possibly be the object of experience, but that guarantees that all the objects of experience will have this kind of explanation. And so the question I'm asking is, so why is that the soul as it would be given to the understanding alone? That is the intelligible or noumenal soul. Um, so I tried to explain last time, um, and I think, I think I'm starting to understand this better than I used to, but it's still in flux. But <laughs> anyway, so I tried to explain last time, first of all, why, like, so here's the object. Now, you know, to begin with, I know that um, the object affects me in a way that conforms to my rule. And so like in this case, my rule is, well, my rule is B, I guess I should say, right? Where the conclusion is A is B. So my rule is B. Um, uh, well, Something I don't understand about my judgment is so important. I know that the object conforms to my rule A, and I'm able to apply my rule B um, to the object of A. But, um, The reason that works is because of a principle in the object, right? I have to wait to see if the object that conforms to A also conforms to B. I guess that's the way to put it. So in the syllogism, in the categorical syllogism, when I find a more 
um, internal condition. Um, right, so, so first of all, okay, so, I never know the complete explanation for why it is that A is B because the complete explanation is in the object. It's not in me. But I, I so to speak, learn more about it when I learn that um, A can be subsumed under some condition C that I already know requires B. Um, that is, I learned that this is one of those objects that conforms to C, and that's why uh, it conforms to B. But that always leaves a further question over. And in like, and in reality, you know, I can never arrive at an absolute explanation in this direction level. I can keep looking for one, and but I never can because experience is always conditioned, meaning that it's like experience is always possible on a, on a condition that I don't have, that I don't know, namely on the condition of something in the object. But like, I think, so this is the way I tried to explain it last time, but I think, you know, I failed to take into account what I was saying just now, namely that this kind of explanation really accounts for possibility and, and not for order. Um, That runs. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to get to is this, like, what is the absolute condition of possibility for every objective state that anything could be in? And the answer to that is the transcendental unity of apperception. <laughs> right? Like, that's the transition to psychology. It's a mistaken transition, but transition, but that's the way the um, the object we're mistakenly looking for gets identified with the noumenal self because it's because the um the transcendental condition of possibility that is the the possibility of objects of experience merely as such without asking what kind they are or anything is um the transcendental unity of apperception. That is, um, in the, the condition of possibility is that whatever state of an object I'm representing, I have to be able to represent myself as subject of the relevant concept, both in this case and in other possible cases. I don't think this picture is making that clear at all.
After all, this syllogism proves that A is B. It doesn't just show that A is possibly B. Oh, there's something I still don't understand about this. But okay, leaving aside what it what it is, I don't understand. I mean, it's okay. But after all, yeah. So I mean, we don't want our absolute inner condition, however, itself to prove that A is B. We want to show that A is B must have some explanation of this kind. That is, we want to show that A can't ever take on a state that isn't accounted for as possible by the nature of A. And if we have one inner condition that accounts for the possibility of every uh, any object taking on any state, um, then we're guaranteed of finding that for the individual ones as well. I think that's how it works. Um, I'm not sure if people follow what I just said. I'm not sure. Uh, well, are there questions about that? So again, this this is this is what I'm now saying. We want to we, we're there has to be something about our representation of the object, and now by the object I mean like everything we represent. Basically, there has to be something about our representation of the object that guarantees that for any a like this, um, there must be something about a's nature such that you can tell that B is a possibility for A. Um, from that aspect of A's nature. And therefore, if A actually is B, you'll be able to explain why A is B. at least to the extent that you'll be able to explain why um, You'll be able to explain why when A is C, A is B. And you'll be able to explain that and that and that. And it will all go back to the general explanation of why any object of any state of any object is possible. 
And that explanation is that um, uh, that there's a subject that's able to represent something in that in something in that state and possibly something else in that state. That's the condition of possibility for an object being in a state because, um, because again, to represent an object, I have to have a rule that I'm demanding that, that the sensations conform to. That is, I have to have a concept. And the condition of being able to represent things by concepts is to be able to represent myself as that kind of um, subject that's present in more than one case. So even though there there could be sensations, things could affect me. Um, and the pos for the possibility of that, I don't need to assume the transcendental unity of apperception. Um, if uh, I'm able to um, represent things using a concept, then um, that unity of apperception has to hold. Um, and since we find that we're discursive intellects, that we represent things using concepts, that was the way that the transcendental deduction works, according to me. Since we find that we are discursive intellects, we conclude that we must succeed in representing such a subject. Now, um, um, I wrote down a quote from the second meditation here that I think, like, I don't know if, if this makes it seem easier to understand than it really is, or if it's a good way of helping to understand it. But anyway, here's the quote. But furthermore, if the perception of the wax seemed more distinct after it was noted by me, not only through vision or touch, but through many causes, how much more distinctly must I now have come to cognize myself? Since there, uh, since there are no reasons which can help the perception either of the wax or of any other body, but such as better prove the nature of my own mind. Right, so Descartes is saying there that every time I learn anything about an object um, and what it's capable of, like the wax, um, I learn even more about my own mind because I learn that I'm capable of representing something like that. Um, So something like that is, I think, what Kant is talking about at the beginning of the paralogisms. So this is on B399, and it's on page 329 in Kemp Smith. And I actually had a bookmark, but I just lost it. Um, that bookmark's in the wrong place anyway. So there's a concept, or if the term be preferred, the judgment, I think. I mean, why is it not clear whether to call this a concept or a judgment? Um, it 
it's because the object to which the concept is being applied in the judgment isn't given by any other concept. Um, so it's a judgment without a subject concept, so to speak. <laughs> I think that's why. Anyway, be that as it may, as is easily seen, this is the vehicle of all concepts and they're all, therefore also of transcendental concepts. And so is always included in the conceiving of these latter and is itself transcendental. Um, And that's why, as Kant is explaining earlier up in the paragraph, um, this is a concept which was not included in the general list of transcendental concepts, but which must yet be counted as belonging to that list without, however, in the least altering it or declaring it defective. So the list of transcendental concepts that we saw before was the table of categories. And Kant is saying this uh, concept, I think, that the concept of the thinking self um, is a, is transcendental, but um, it uh, doesn't belong in the table of categories because um, uh, it's not about the object. So in the B edition, now, I mean, what I was just reading is from the beginning of the paralogisms, which is the same in the A and the B editions before the, the big change happens, right? So the very beginning, this happens in the transcendental deduction too, like the very beginning of the paralogisms is the same in both editions, but then like the main part of it, which was really long in the A edition, Kant, in the case of the paralogisms, Kant replaced with a completely new text, which is much shorter in the B edition. So this this text is from the A and the B edition, which is why like it can't refer back to um, um, to a section that's only found in the B edition. Namely, back to this oops, section that I love so well, section 12, about what I, the convertible transcendentals. Kant doesn't use the term convertible transcendentals, but that's what this is a list of, right? One, true, and good. And again, here, right, he says that there's these apparently transcendental concepts but we haven't put them on the table. And why haven't we put them on the table? Um, um, because as he says later on, these supposedly transcendental predicates of things are in fact, nothing but logical requirements and criteria of all knowledge of things in general. Um, And he says that uh, um, Right, and he says that uh, when that these three convertible transcendentals are basically unity, plurality, and totality, 
but now they've been given a qualitative rather than a quantitative meaning. So like in all object of a knowledge, there is unity of a, in all knowledge of an object, there is unity of concept, which we may be entitled qualitative unity. Um, and as you may remember in the transcendental deduction in the B edition, right? So this, this section 12 is only in the B edition. In the transcendental B-131. Oh, I am on the right page. Right. In the Transcendental Deduction in the B edition, when discussing the um, transcendental unity of apperception, he says, this unity which precedes a priori all concepts of combination is not the category of unity, Section 10, for all categories are grounded in logical functions of judgment, and in these functions, combination and therefore unity of concepts is already thought. Right? That is, when, um, when we have a universal judgment, which represents its object as all one, um, we're already thinking of having a concept that can be applied in more than one case. So like we're already assuming the transcendental unity of apperception. Um, so that and all the other forms of combination that uh, correspond to the categories must already be presupposed uh, sorry, all, th all those already presuppose the transcendental unity of apperception. And so he says, thus the category already presupposes combination. We must therefore look yet higher for this unity as qualitative. And then he refers you back to section 12. Right? So the transcendental unity of apperception, this, th this is the, it's basically, well, I wouldn't say it's just this. But this is my best evidence, maybe, for why that section 12 is not just a weird historical oddity, like, like, oh, by the way, the scholastics had these weird concepts, and maybe this is what they were thinking, or something like that. But no, you can see that he refers back to it when he explains what the transcendental unity of apperception is. So it's actually really important, that qualitative unity. Um, and again, the qualitative unity that we're talking about is not on the table of categories because it's doesn't it's not really about any kind of objective unity. It's really about the unity of, well, the unity of my concept, but fundamentally it's about the unity of me that allows me to have one concept. And if we go back to the paralogisms, and now the part that's only in the B edition. So this is page 372 in Kemp Smith. Um, All right, I can't re read what I wrote here. I didn't like the translation, but I don't remember why. Anyway, and with the objective reality of the concept of substance, the allied concept of simplicity likewise vanishes. It is transformed into a merely logical qualitative unity of self-consciousness in thought in general. Right, so there's that qualitative unity again. 
So like I said, at the beginning of the paralogisms were the texts from the A edition. Now you might ask me, what does he mean in the A edition? And I don't know, it's a good question. I used to teach the A edition. Maybe I should do that again someday. Um, but uh, I, that is, I used to give this course, but use the A edition rather than the B edition. <laughs> um, but um, but in any case, in the B edition, you know, when we get to the to the new texts, he again refers us back to that qualitative unity. I mean, it doesn't say here section twelve, so it's not clear, quite as clear. But I think that's what he's talking about. Again, he's talking about a qualitative subjective unity that um, in a sense is transcendental, but doesn't belong on the table of categories because um, although it's presupposed by all the categories, it doesn't belong in the table of categories because it's not um, a feature of the representation of an object. Now he also says, if we go back again to the beginning, meanwhile, however, free, oh, sorry, meanwhile, however free it be of empirical admixture, impressions of the senses, it yet enables us to distinguish through the nature of our faculty of representation, two kinds of objects. I, as thinking, am an object of inner sense and am called soul. That which is an object of the outer senses is called body. So this part is harder to understand. Um, but because again, it has something to do with that question what is inner about inner sense? <laughs> um, in what sense is it inner? And once again, because of what Kant says about it in the Amphiboly, where he says that Leibniz would have been right to say that, that all substances have to be uh, minds, if he were right to say that every substance must contain an absolute internal condition. So Leibniz would have been right to say that because we don't know of any internal conditions except those that are given to inner sense. So, uh, um, so somehow inner sense is, is in some legitimate sense inner. <laughs> um, uh, and um, but so although I don't know I explain that completely, I think I can explain again like why it is really a, like as opposed to the dialectical inferences, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But why is it really that transcendental apperception allows me to distinguish between the object of inner sense and the object of outer sense? And it has something to do with the fact that, you know, uh, um, the objects of outer sense are all different from each other, but they're all given in inner sense. So it's, again, it's that thing that Descartes is talking about, like that um, when I learn anything about the wax, I'm also learning about my own mind. Um, Um, so, you know, like that's what shows, but somehow it should be true by definition, I think, of inner sense. But like, that's what shows that it's the object of inner sense that's going to be fit to fulfill this role, namely of representing a subject that continues to exist um, throughout all my uses of different concepts. So, so again, like 
the correct conclusion here is, I mean, the, the correct argument in this vicinity is the metaphysical, is the transcendental deduction. And it does show that um, the soul, the object of inner sense exists, but it doesn't show that it's a substance or that it's simple or that it's one, right? It doesn't show any of the things that rational psychology is going to try to show. Um, and it doesn't show that because it, the soul that, that, that it shows exists is the empirical soul. Um, and, uh, it's not simple, right? It's like, it's always changing. <laughs> um, uh, and it's not substance. That was the point of the refutation of idealism. No substance, nothing permanent is given in inner sense. So if there's going to be a substance, it's going to have to be external. And there must be a substance by the first analogy. Um, therefore, there must be a body. That was the refutation of idealism. Okay, so that's the real point. But again, instead, the transcendental dialectic is going to, uh, sorry, the, the, the paralogisms as part of the transcendental dialectic, the mistake is going to be that we say, we look at this um, absolute condition of possibility for experience, namely the transcendental unity of apperception. And we say, um, so some object must be given through that. Because again, we're looking for something in the object that will guarantee what we need in the case of the categorical syllogism. So we say some object must be given through the transcendental unity of apperception. And then, um, oh, I just got a message saying remote in instruction for Tuesday and Wednesday. So at least that answers the question about Wednesday. <laughs> It's going to be remote instruction. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, which once again means I'll be teaching from the basement while our house cleaners clean the rest of the house. <laughs> all right. In any case. Um, all right. Um, getting back to Kant. Um, right. And so... Um, then it says, well, what kind of object can this be that could be given merely through the transcendental unity of apperception? Right? It can't be empirical because it's in a sense like it's supposed to be that by, by knowing this object, we understand the possibility of all the states of all empirical objects. Um, so it can't be empirical. What is it going to be like? So that's the step where we, we move into transcendent metaphysics, right? Now we're talking about something that is not possibly an object of experience, and yet we think we know something about it based on experience. We think we can infer to it. Um, so in particular, like the that qualitative unity, um, which is the fundamental uh, moment here. I guess that's a correct, correct use of the word moment. <laughs> I, I really wish I knew where Kant got the word no moment, like exactly why he uses that, but never mind. I don't. So back to this. Um, so, uh, qualitative unity that is like unum transcendentale <laughs> uh, is uh, um, is taken to mean Simplicity. Mm 
Now, I mean, um, there's a couple things to say about this. I think so. First of all, the paralogisms go in the order of the categories only. Sorry. Uh, they go in this order, right? Kot says, we start with the category of substance by which a thing as such is given. And then we go through the remaining categories backwards. Why backwards? He doesn't really explain. <laughs> but it's backwards in the sense that um, right, the usual order is quantity, quality, relation, modality. So we go, we start with relation, and then we go backwards to quality, and then we go backwards to quantity, and then we go back around to the end of the modality. So that's what this order is. Um, so, um, and moreover, uh, although he doesn't say this, what we get here are the first column moments or categories. So here we get substance, here we get unity, here we get possibility, although this is a little weird, but he, like, I mean, I guess I should put, maybe I should put up the table here so you can see what Right, it's this table. The soul is substance as regards its quality. Well, that's the one I didn't fill in, but because we expect reality here, right? That's the first moment of quality, but instead we get simplicity. Oops, can you see what I was writing? Right, we expect substance, reality, unity, possibility. But instead, we get substance, simplicity, unity, possibility. Right? So the soul is substance. As regards its quality, it is simple. As regards the different times in which it exists, it is numerically identical. That is unity, not plurality. And number four, it is in relation to possible objects in space. See, that's weird. But there it is. He definitely emphasizes possible. So he's trying to continue that pattern somehow. Um, okay, so that's the order we're going in here. So um, um, so you might ask, well, now I've got three convertible transcendentals. Where am I going to put them? But I think I already started the answers on, right? Well, let me not use a lot in this one. Right? They're one true and good or perfect, as Kant often glosses the good here. And so the the qualitative unity corresponds to simplicity. Now, so I mean, there's like two questions about this. Why is simplicity, or why would simplicity be a, an objective qualitative unity? Simplicity means not having parts, right? It's the opposite of of. Um, Compositeness, composition, complexity, you might say, but uh, um, why is why is objective qualitative unity simplicity? So 
And by the way, the same thing is going to turn up in the antinomies. So in the antinomies, we're going to get second column constants in the regular order. But instead of negation, which we would expect when we get to quality, we're going to get a uh, division. So, uh, right, that is, well, actually, we're not going to read the second antinomy. <laughs> but if you do read the second antinomy, you'll see it's the antinomy of division. Um, so, um, so there's definitely, um, some identification that's being made here between simplicity and reality versus negation versus division or composition and uh, negation. And I'm not sure exactly how to explain this, except I think, so like if you go to B419, On page, I didn't write down the page. Camp Smith. Um, okay. Now in space, there is nothing real which can be simple. Points, which are only the which are the only simple things in space, are merely limits, not themselves anything that can as parts serve to serve to constitute space. This is for anyone who's in 100 C. This is this this is Kant basically rejecting Hume's theory of the simple in space. Um, so. Uh, um, And yeah, I guess, I mean, if we thought a little bit more about what Hume says there, which fortunately, since I'm supposed to lecture on it today, I have on the top of my mind, you know, Hume says that um, when, when you compose certain things together, you don't add any reality to them. There's actually, there's an argument like this in Leibniz too, at the beginning of the monodology. When you put two different things together, you don't add any reality to them. So Hume and Leibniz both conclude that there can't be composite things unless there are simple things for them to be made up of, because the reality has to all be in the simple thing. Right? The composition adds nothing, so to speak. <laughs> um, Uh, now we know from the amphiboly, like Kant thinks there's an answer to that somehow in the case of phenomena. And I don't want to try to explain what that is, but you know, that, um, uh, yeah, they don't really have any reality that doesn't consist in their relation to other things. But, um, but now that we're trying to think about something that's not a phenomenon. That that argument doesn't apply. And so like whatever is real in it must be simple. So like objective qualitative unity of a, a noumenon, so to speak, would be simplicity. I say so to speak, because we don't really know real in real life, according to Kant, we don't know what simplicity means in the case of a new mind, right? We don't understand how they can be put together. <laughs> um, but uh um but that's the way it would be. So that's also why Leibniz's monads are simple. And we're I mean, we're basically talking about Leibniz's monads here. I, I should probably say to I pr pr maybe should have said to begin with, 
though I kind of implied it. So like the version of rational psychology we're talking about here is basically Wolf's. It's the Leibnizio Wolfian system. And um and although these arguments are very similar or are closely related to arguments in Descartes' second meditation, um Kant thinks actually thinks that Descartes follows a different method. And uh, and actually thinks that Descartes' method is better, even though he still makes a mistake, right? So, um, uh, in fact, in case I don't, well, actually, I'm on exactly the right page already. I'll show this to you. Descartes, Kant thinks Descartes, rather than starting from relation, starts from modality. It's modality because it's starting with existence, as he says on the previous page. Now, why existence rather than possibility? That's kind of an issue. But anyway, so he says, this is Descartes' procedure. I think as subject, as simple subject, and as identical subject in every state of my thought, that is modality, relation, quantity, sorry, quality, quantity, right? So, um, Descartes starts with modality um, and goes backwards, relation, quality, quantity. All right, if I get a chance, I'll, I'll try, oops, I was pointing to something you can see. Descartes starts with modality and then goes backwards, Relation, quality, quantity. If I get a chance, I'll say something about what Kant thinks Descartes is doing and why it's different. But, okay, so we're basically talking about a Leibnizian monad here. We're learning what they must be like. So, um, I think we can understand these other two the same way. Right? So, like, this one is really, and when I say it the same way, so in other words, I'm claiming that, that there's two different orders both at work here in some way. Um, And it's weird. It's it's like it's like turned inside out because um, normally quantity, quality, and relation go together as the real categories that that represent a thing. Um, right? They represent it as extended, as having some reality sorry, as extended, as having some reality across that extension and as um, being a substance that has that reality. Um, but now, somehow, uh, these three are being put together because we're going back a little bit. <laughs> um, and therefore, um, Modality is being looked at as a sort of combination of quality and quantity in the wrong order. Okay, I don't know how to explain completely or very much at all why that's happening here. Um, I do think that's like it's that type of thing that has to be explained to understand what Kant is doing. Um, uh, but um, but I think I can I can make it plausible that these things go together, right? Because transcendental truth, if you look back to section 12, so Kant says, like, every concept, for example, must uh, um, 
it must be one, but it must also like yield a plurality of consequences. Um, and the more consequences it yields, the greater its truth or something like that. So, um, um, so this similarly, this unity here is the unity of the soul throughout its changing states. Right, so this is just the, the simplicity of the soul. This is the, the soul's um, um, that simplicity spread out into all its different consequences, that is all its different states. Um, and then finally, this one, which is about the relation to possible objects. So, I mean, I think like, we expect we expect what what's possible here to be the soul, and instead it's the object that's being called possible. That's what's weird about that fourth one on the table. But I mean, I think they go together in the sense that this simple soul must be compossible with any object. That is, uh, um, um, it must be possible for this one simple soul to represent to to accompany the representation of any object, and that is a kind of um, adequacy of all the consequences to the one principle, which is how Kant explains transcendental perfection. Okay. So, um, and so you, if you ask, what about this one? And I think, um, I mean, this has something to do with why Kant says we start with the category of relation by which, or the category of substance by which a thing as such is represented. That it's, um, There isn't one thing of which these three transcendentals are attributes. Because no thing is given through them. Right? I mean, again, the way the only way that the subject can actually be given as one is as the object of these categories through the way I it, I affect myself. So uh, like these things don't represent a thing, but if you wanted them to represent a thing, you would need to add something else, <laughs> right? Like you you couldn't just say that, that, that the soul is simplicity, unity, and possibility or calm possibility, I guess is the way I'm understanding it, right? You have to say the soul is a thing that is simple and one and calm possible, right? Um, and so that's why you bring in this category of substance. Okay. Um, Are there questions about this? Because I'm about to, you'll probably be glad to know I'm about to go on and discuss something somewhat different. <laughs> You're actually happy to know. I mean, this this is what I this is what I really am trying to understand about this section, but you could probably read the section many times and not notice <laughs> the questions that I'm raising here. And yet, like I said, I think that, that that's what really has to be understood if we're going to understand if we're going to understand what is supposed to be happening in paralogism. Um, but um, but I want to say something now about the actual syllogism that Kant gives and how it's supposed to correspond to all the weird stuff I was just talking about. Um, 
Um, so, like I said, the dialectical syllogism that Kant actually gives as an example is itself a categorical syllogism. Right? It's on... Um, So the bottom of B410, top of B411, and it's uh, page 371 in Kemp Smith. Actually, let me write it on the board, although in abbreviated form. So. That which cannot be thought. Otherwise than as subject. And so what it says here is, does not exist otherwise than as subject and is therefore substance. I'll just write is substance. <laughs> That's the major premise. So this is the condition. This is the condition. But anyway, cannot be thought otherwise than as subject. And then the minor premise is a thinking being merely as such. Not be thought otherwise than as subject. Right? So, as we expect in the minor premise, we subsume something under the condition. And what we subsume under the condition is a thinking being as such. And therefore, the conclusion is going to be. Thinking being as a substance. So, um, and note again, this is the this is the Wolf version of the argument. So, like if you look at the beginning of Wolf's German Metaphysics. Um, You'll, you'll see that there's a version of the meditations argument, but it's like in the third person and universal rather than in the first person, right? And so rather than proving that I am a substance, it proves that a thinking thing is a substance. That's, that's basically what Kant is, is engaging with there. Um, so... Um, Kant says this syllogism is a paralogism. So what is a paralogism, um, you might ask? Um, as far as I can tell, a paralogism just means a like an invalid syllogism. By the way, I say paralogism. I've heard some people say paralogism. I'm not sure which is right, but I keep saying paralogism. All right, so uh, it might depend whether you're accenting it as Greek or Latin. But actually maybe it should be, no, I don't know, anyway. And in Latin, the accent is going to be on the ism. <laughs> Parallel. Jism. <laughs> All right. Anyway, never mind that. Okay. So um, so as far as I know, paralogism just means uh, uh, invalid syllogism. Like I haven't found a more technical use for it. 
Um, so why, so aren't all the three parts of the dialectic, don't they all contain paralogisms? I think the answer is yes, all three contain paralogisms, but uh, in the other parts, there's something else, <laughs> right? So in the antinomy, there's not only paralogisms, but they there's conflicting conclusions. And in the ideal, there's not only paralogisms, but there's uh, like, um, um, uh, hypostatization of, of the transcendental idea. Something like that. Anyway, um, so, okay, so I don't think we can get any clue to what's going wrong here just from the fact that Kant calls it a paralogism. But he says something more specific about why it's faulty. Um, the conclusion is arrived at fallaciously per sophisma figurae dictionis. So um, the fallacy that he's talking about, it's often called the fallacy of four, ter of four terms or the fallacy of equivocation. And it happens when the, the middle term is used in different senses in the major than it is in the minor. Right, so like if you were to say, you know, major premise, a bank is a good place to put your money. Minor premise, the side of a river is a bank. Conclusion, the side of a river is a good place to put your money. That would be an example of this kind of fallacy, right? Because bank is used in two different senses in the two premises, and therefore the conclusion doesn't follow. And it, right, it's called the fallacy of four terms because it's actually, well, it looks, right, a real syllogism only has three terms, the, the subject of the conclusion, the predicate of the conclusion, and the middle term. Um, in this fallacy of equivocation, there's actually four terms because this is different things. Right? So this is like bank sub one, and this is bank sub two. So Kant says, this is that kind of fallacy. So we understand that the problem is that this cannot be thought otherwise than as subject is used in two different ways in these two premises. Um, Now, by the way, as I mentioned before, there is one syllogism in the antinomy. Um, so this is on B525, and it's on page 443 in Kemp Smith. And yeah, as I said, it's not so much as an example as a as like a uh, summary of the whole thing. So it's supposed to include, I guess, all four of the the uh, dialectical syllogisms that aren't actually written out. The whole antinomy of pure reason rests upon the dialectical argument. If the conditioned is given, the entire series of all its conditions is likewise given. So that's a hypothetical judgment, right? If the condition is given, then the entire series of all its conditions is likewise given. So we know that this is a hypothetical syllogism. And then here's the minor premise. Object of the senses are given as conditioned. Therefore, right? so the conclusion will be the entire series of all conditions of objects of the senses are likewise given, or is likewise given. Um, so like I said, I don't know exactly, I mean, it's nice, <laughs> it's like, it's neat <laughs> that when we get to the second 
type of dialectical illusion corresponding to the hypothetical syllogism. The dialectical syllogism itself is hypothetical, but I don't know exactly how to explain it. But um, um, presumably here, there's also, a, oh, wait, does he actually, I think he actually says here, even that it's a sophisma figuri victimus. I think he does, but it's not right here, so it's not proven. Um, but anyway, like it seems like the problem again is going to be um, given as conditioned, right? Given as conditioned is the condition. <laughs> it's confusing in this syllogism. Ray, that like if something is given as conditioned, the entire series of all its conditions is likewise given. That's actually a weird hypothetical judgment. It's the kind where the subject is the same in the pre in the um, antecedent and the consequent. Right, so actually, fallacy of equivocation, it's not exactly the same fallacy. The condition is actually actually, this is weird. I'm not sure this is really a valid, so it looks like a valid syllogism. The antecedent in the minor is not the same as the antecedent in the major. All right, well, <laughs> there's more problems with that syllogism. Anyway, but it also, uh, I think Kant says somewhere that it also involves a sophisma figura dictionis, which presumably the the equivocation is on given as conditioned there. I mean, maybe it should really be understood as a categorical syllogism. That would help with my problem. But then why does he write it that way? Okay, sorry. I shouldn't have spent any time on that. Um, so the equivocation now, I mean, and Kant says, of course, this is not an equivocation like the two uses of bank, right? It's not like um, just a sophistical trick. There's an, in, there's an inherent uh, ambiguity in our concept cannot be thought otherwise than in a subject. It's a transcendental amphiboly, you might say, although is it the same as the transcendental amphiboly that's in the amphiboly? I'm not sure. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. But anyway, there's... Um, there's something about these two uses that's like inherently like we tend to they are sort of the same concept only applied in a different way and therefore we're um um we're subject to this powerful illusion that we can't ever completely get out of that that this syllogism is valid so where in particular in this long phrase does that happen? <laughs> I mean, I used to actually a long time ago, well, not that long ago, but anyway, I used to suggest that maybe the equivocation is on subject, that subject means one thing here and something else there. Um, 
But I knew even when I suggested that, that it doesn't match very well with what Kant says. Um, because in that footnote that I read before, so it's the footnote on B411, well, it starts on B411 anyway, and it's on page 371 in Camp Smith. He says, thought is taken in the two premises in totally different senses. As relating to an object in general and therefore to an object as it may be given in it sorry, in the major premise as relating to an object in general, oops, and therefore to an object as it may be given in intuition, in the minor premise, only as it consists in relation to self-consciousness. In this latter sense, no object whatsoever is being thought. So it's... Kant is, seems to be saying that it's the cannot be thought. And of course, not the cannot be part, but the thought part. That is, what is it that can't be? It can't be thought other than otherwise than as subject. Um, so this is a kind of, and he says the difference is that here we're saying. It can't be thought at all, otherwise it's a subject, even when you add intuitions to the thought. Whereas here we're saying it can't be thought otherwise than a subject if you if you try to represent it with thought alone. Right? That's what he said in that passage I just read. The major premise is relating to an object in general and therefore to an object as it may be given in intuition. In the minor premise, only as it consists in relation to self consciousness. Uh, or maybe in the former premise, we are speaking of things which cannot be thought otherwise than as subject, but in the latter premise, we speak not of things but of thought. Well, maybe it's maybe this language is actually not as clear as I think, but that's, I thought, but that's what I, I, I think he means, right? In that here, so, um, what can't be cognized other than as subject is a substance. Um, and, uh, um, as he says in many occasions, um, we don't understand what could have that special logical property until we supply the schema of the category of substance. And then we understand why this thing, which can be represented by thought plus intuition, can only be represented by thought plus intuition as subject, namely as subject of changing states and not itself as a predicate of something else. That is, as a possible changing state of something else. Um, but here in this premise, so this premise is correct, right? And that's in general, that's true of, of this type of fallacy. Both premises are right, but the conclusion is wrong because of the equivocation. And I'm sorry, I'm out of time, so I'll just. <laughs> quickly try to say what's happening here, that um, on the other hand, when I try to represent the thinking being 
for example, myself, without using intuition, um, that is, so in real life, if I forget, if I abstract from the intuitions by which that one substance, that one subject is actually given, that is the object of inner sense, if I abstract from that, what's left of my representation of that one subject? Well, only those convertible transcendentals, the transcendental unity of apperception. Um, so those don't say anything other than that this thing is the subject of the different representations. So once you make that abstraction, you can only represent it as subject. So this is also right. But the conclusion here is that a thinking being can only be represented um, in any way, including with intuition, as a substance. And now this uh, intuition is going to have to be intellectual intuition, right? Because this is not the kind of thing that be given, can be given in experience. And so we've concluded that a thinking being is a noumenon, it's a noumenal substance. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, there's obviously a lot more to say about this, but uh, I've gone several minutes over and I have another class coming up. So um, I will uh, see you on Zoom apparently on Wednesday. Bye.